We are in um, our middle of our summer series. We're literally probably at the middle of our King of Kings. Jesus according to Matthew. Um, this week we're going to talk about what Jesus brings up in Matthew 16. It's, it's interesting that it takes 33-ish years for Jesus to bring up this most quintessential of all questions that every one of us, everyone will have to face. And when we face it, the decision we make with that question then determines where we go in life. It takes Matthew 16 chapters, 33 years for Jesus to get to this question. Who do you say that I am? A quintessential question that we all have to answer. So um, I don't have the... um, I don't have the verses on the screen today. You're going to actually have to, if you brought a Bible with you, open it. You're going to have to get your device out and look. Um, I read out of NIV. People ask me, Pastor, why do you read out of NIV? And I'd love to give you this great theological understanding for that. But I grew up uh, with the King James Version, so it was the first thing that came about after the King James Version that I liked. So I've stuck with it. All right? So there you go. If you want the most poetic and at least what's considered to be the most accurate, then you want to pick up New American Standard, but not many people end up reading for that. Here, I'm going to I'll piece this passage together. Matthew 16, 5 through 8, and then 11 through 27. So when they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, Is it because we didn't bring any bread? Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, You of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Verse 11. How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread. (laughs) I'm really glad of all the descriptions in the New Testament because I'm not the only one that it takes Jesus a few times to kind of get to, through what he's trying to say, right? They, they understood, they were, oh, he's not talking about bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his, asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, or the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day would be raised to life. Here is this Here is this first download in those words to the disciples. And so here is Peter's response. Here is the guy who just said, oh, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now responds, by says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. You, you, You getting that? Jesus, we need to talk. I don't, think you've, I don't think you've got that ending right. That's, that's not how this is, this is going to end. So the very person that was, well, you're the Christ, which is, by the way, is not Jesus' last name. It's his title, King, Messiah. Right after he makes that revelation, he's saying, but it's not going to turn out that way, Jesus. So Jesus said, after patting him on the back in one regard, says, get behind me, Satan. There's a humbling, there's a humbling rebuke. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So then Jesus said to his disciples in that context, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. 
What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet for forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for the soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. 16 chapters, 33 years, there had been a fair sampling size of who Jesus was, his teaching, his miracles, his compassion. You would have had a really, really good sample size to make a decision on who he was. But what Jesus leads with, he doesn't lead with the question, who do you say that I am? He leads with the question, who do people around us say that I am? Well, the answers come, which means they have heard. They have heard the people talking about who Jesus was. Jesus was an enigma in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Well, and, and so, well, they're hearing, well, he's John the Baptist. Well, John the Baptist had already been beheaded, but Scripture was talking about this raising up of John the Baptist. So people said, well, he must be John the Baptist. Others would say, no, 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 he's not John the Baptist. He's Elijah. Elijah was an Old Testament prophet that did not see death but was called away with angels and a chariot of fire. And Elijah's going to return, so he's got to be Elijah. And others said Jeremiah. Does Jesus ask this question because he's concerned about what everybody else is saying about him? I would say no. I would say he has no curiosity of what people are saying about him. I, I, I would say that he has a complete understanding of what people think about who he is in the different camps that would have believed that. So why would he lead with this question, this magnitude of question, who, who do you say I am, with who does other people say that I am? I, I would put forward for this reason. Understand the context he opens with. He says that he does not want them to be impacted by the yeast of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. In other words, the Pharisees and Sadducees were teaching things that weren't truth and definitely weren't truth about him. Now, yeast is a, is a, it ends up being a complicated metaphor in Scripture because Jesus uses it multiple ways. Now, I'm not a baker, so I, I, don't, I mean, that's a little confusing when I opened my mother-in-law's refrigerator one time when we first married and, and I saw this little mason jar with something in it and I said, what's that? And my mother-in-law said, yeast. And that you grow yeast and then you put yeast in. I, I, didn't, I didn't get it. I just know that when she made stuff, I ate it. And it was really good. So I'll, I'll follow you. You know, I'll go with it. But the idea, and so, but Jesus used yeast multiple times. He says the kingdom of God's like yeast. That, that, that even though it looks small, that you, you insert it into your life and you, and you let it breathe and, and you give it some room. And it's amazing how big the kingdom of God is. But then, then he says sin's like yeast. I'm like, well, now you just messed up the metaphor. I like the one with the kingdom, but it's the same principle. He said when you let a little sin, and, and don't think of sin as much as a, um, an action. Think of it as an attitude of I'm going to do things my way. A couple weeks ago I told you that we had a kingdom. His kingdom converges on this kingdom. It causes a clash and always creates a choice. And any time I choose to do something my way and not his way, I'm not trusting him. Thus, we go back to the original sin of he's, God's holding out on us. So Jesus says, yeast as sin, it kind of starts and it grows. And then now he uses it against the Pharisees and Sadducees. So here, here is what I believe Jesus is ultimately asking. Are other people's opinions of me impacting your knowledge of me. We all live in this world. We all live in this culture. We all live in this kingdom. There are a lot of things said about who Jesus is. So before he asks, who do you say that I am, he's interested to see, is what's going on around us right now, is other people's opinions, is it having an impact on who you think I am, because you need to be careful of that yeast because I'm someone different. And here comes this revelation of Peter. Peter is the first one to step up. He's the spokesperson. He's not giving his own revelation. He's, this is a revelation from the 12. And they're like, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. Now what's fascinating here is Jesus didn't say you've come to a good conclusion. What he says is, 
flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So in other words, he's saying that as smart as people can be, you don't, we don't get to figure out God. God is he's revealed to us. And when that revelation comes, man, you know it. Don, I think back last week when we baptized you at the end and you said it was 2008. I was sitting on the end of my bed and I just, I just knew, right? That is, that is a revelation. That is God stepping into our world and it's a revelation. And what I love about revelations when God gives a re- revelation, especially over that we're sinful, or we've chosen a path of life that's not his path, when we come into his kingdom, there comes an immediate response from God. There is an affirmation that of what has just taken place, and it happens here. Peter, you didn't just figure this out on your own. You know why this is true, Peter? Because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. Who do people say that I am? Who am I to you? The second question is a question all of us have to answer. We're going to answer in this life or we're going to answer in the next. And how we answer that question determines our life direction, determines what we do, when we do it, how we do it. Why we do it. It's why it's the most important question that can ever be asked and answered. Who do you say that I am? And will you be impacted by what everybody else says? Are you going to be impacted by a revelation of God to you? Now, for a lot of years, I've taught a course or I've facilitated a course called the Alpha Course. The Alpha Course is a 10-week introduction of the Christian faith. And I have, I have prayed with more people to receive Christ and with more people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit coming out of Alpha than I have in anything else I've ever done in ministry. And we do it here. And we do it every, in the fall. We'll do it in September. And the second, the second teaching out of Alpha answers this very question. Who is Jesus? And because I'm, in, I'm such a big fan of Alpha, and I want you to participate in it at some level, I also thought I cannot encapsulate in 20 minutes what they do in answering the question, who is Jesus? So I want to watch with you. Last year you might have been here when we talked about who is the Holy Spirit, and I showed one. And so this is the one, this is one about Jesus. He is arguably the most famous person in history. Over two billion people claim to follow him. That's one third of the world's population. He's represented in art and literature more than any other figure. Time magazine called him the most influential person who has ever lived. But who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Mm. Uh, uh, um, uh, I think... Uh, uh, I believe he was a person. Um, he is the son of God. I don't believe Jesus ever really existed. The son of God. If I have to answer that question, I would say God. Uh, he plays on the wing for Chelsea. If you read the Bible, I, I don't think I believe in all of that. Everything. <laughs> he can be any, but for me he's everything. Who is Jesus? To be honest with you, I don't know. I'm not super religious or anything, so. I mean, he, I guess he's a savior or something. <laughs> Personally, I think that Jesus was probably a really cool dude who lived a long time ago and gave great advice to people, and it snowballed from there. For much of my life, I wasn't a Christian. I come from a family of trial lawyers, barristers. My father was a barrister, my mother was a barrister, my sister is a barrister, My son qualified as a barrister. My daughter qualified as a barrister. Both my grandfathers on both sides were barristers. My uncle was a barrister. If we'd had a cat, it would definitely have been a barrister. My father was a a Jew, a secular Jew. He escaped the Holocaust. Many of his family had died in the Holocaust. My mother was not a churchgoer. My father described himself as an agnostic. And I came to the conclusion that I was an atheist as a teenager, and I was quite an argumentative atheist. Not that I was out to convert people to atheism, but if anyone tried to convert me to Christianity, 
then I had a lot to say on the subject. And I was quite suspicious of Christians. I'd come across one or two of them in my gap year, and they had these smiles, which I found deeply suspicious. And in my first year at university, I had a room next to door to my great friend, Nicky Lee, and I warned him against these Christians. I said, don't let them into your room, whatever you do. But it was too late. He met some, and one time he and his then-girlfriend, now his wife, Scylla, came back, and they said that they had become Christians. I was horrified. I mean, they were such lovely people. I thought, how can I help them? I, I really didn't know anything about it, so I thought, I better investigate. So I managed to find this old Bible, and that night I started reading it. I started the beginning of the New Testament. I read Matthew's Gospel, Mark, Luke. I got about halfway through John's Gospel, about three in the morning, I fell asleep. The following day, I carried on reading. All that day, all the next day, all the day afterwards, I was a student, so I didn't have any work to do. And when I got to the end of the New Testament, I came to the conclusion, it's true. You can't prove Christianity mathematically. You can't prove it scientifically. Science is obviously very important, but science answers a different set of questions. Science answers the questions, when and how did this world come into being? But it can't answer the question, who and why? Supposing I had a cake here, which I've made, and I give it to a scientist, the scientist will be able to answer the question, how it was made, they may be able to tell you when it was made, but only I can tell you who made it and why I made it. Only the creator of the cake can do that. Only I can tell you I made that cake, and I can tell you why I made that cake. And it's the same with this universe. Only the creator can reveal who made this world and why he made it. And the claim of Christianity is that he has done that. The Creator has revealed himself. And he's revealed himself in the person of Jesus. And the evidence is not scientific evidence. That's not the only kind of evidence. But historical evidence. When I was a barrister, that's what we relied on. We relied on historical evidence that we presented to a jury. It was things that had happened in the past. They weren't there. Every time a jury brings back a verdict, it's a step of faith based on evidence. And I myself could not be a Christian if I didn't believe that there was evidence. I couldn't just take a blind leap of faith. For me... Faith in Jesus is a step of faith based on good historical evidence. Why start with Jesus, you might say? I didn't even believe there was a God. But I came to believe in God through Jesus. Because the resurrection of Jesus strongly suggests that this world has a creator. And that that creator is to be seen in terms of, through the lens of, Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth is believed to have walked these streets around 2,000 years ago. But is there any evidence that he even existed? Well, there's actually quite a lot of evidence. No serious historian would deny that Jesus existed. The Roman historians Tacitus and Suetonius wrote about Jesus, as did the first century Jewish historian Josephus. He described him as Jesus, a doer of wonderful works. And then he goes on to describe his crucifixion and alleged resurrection. So there is evidence outside of the New Testament for the existence of Jesus, but most of the evidence comes from within inside the New Testament. And sometimes people say, well, the New Testament was written such a long time ago. How do we know what was written down hasn't been changed over the years? Well, the answer is that we do know because of a science called textual criticism. Textual criticism examines the number of copies of early texts that we have available to us today. And it looks at the time gap between the original document and the earliest copy that we have. 
And basically, the more manuscripts we have and the earlier they are, the less doubt there's going to be about the original. So let's compare the Bible to other texts in ancient history, ones that are widely used in schools and universities. Let's look at the Greek historians Herodotus and Thucydides. They both wrote in the 5th century BC. But the earliest copy of their writings that we have dates from AD 900, and that makes a 1,300-year time lapse. And even then, we only have eight copies of these manuscripts in the first place. Or look at the Roman historian Tacitus. There's a thousand-year gap between his book being written and our first manuscript, and we only have 20 copies. Or another classic, Caesar's Gallic War, 950 years between the book being written and our first manuscript copy. And even then, we only have nine or ten copies of these manuscripts. Again, with Livy's famous History of Rome, a 900-year gap between the book being written and our first manuscript, and we only have 20 copies of this. But when it comes to the New Testament, well, it's very different. The New Testament was written between about 40 and 100 AD, and we have manuscript evidence going back as early as 130 AD, and full manuscripts by 350 AD. And we have more than 5,300 Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin translations, and 9,300 others. So, you know, we can be pretty confident in the accuracy, the authenticity, and the integrity of the New Testament scriptures that have been passed down to us today. The remarkable thing about the Bible is there's such a short chronological distance between the events being described and our first manuscripts. So in many ways, the Bible scholars are in a very fortunate position of being able to check these things out and finding that they are much more reliable than, for example, some of the alternatives you're looking at. And as a scholar, I am more than happy to say, I trust this, I take it very, very seriously, I rely on it. Professor F.J.A. Hort, one of the greatest scholars in the area of textual criticism, concluded that, in the variety and fullness of the evidence on which it rests, the text of the New Testament stands absolutely and unapproachably alone amongst ancient prose writings. And no secular historian would disagree with that conclusion. So we know from evidence outside and inside the New Testament that Jesus existed. But who was he? Well, we know that he was fully human. He had a human body. He ate, he drank, he sweated, he got tired, he suffered pain. And he had human emotions, love, joy, sadness, and human experiences. He had the experience of growing up in a family, of education, of having a job, of being tempted. And he experienced bereavement and suffering and torture and even death. Many today will say, OK, he was a human being, but only a human being. Maybe he was a great religious teacher, but no more than that. Others would say he was much more than that. Bono, the lead singer of the band U2, has said, I don't think you're led off easily by saying he was a great thinker or philosopher, because actually he went around saying he was the Messiah. That's why he was crucified. He was crucified because he said he was the Son of God. So he either, in my view, was the Son of God or he was nuts. And I find it hard to accept that all the millions and millions of lives, half the earth for nearly 2,000 years, have felt their lives touched and inspired by some nutter. I don't believe it. He went on to say, I believe that Jesus was the Son of God. What evidence is there to suggest that Jesus was more than just a great religious teacher? There are two parts to this argument. The first is, what did Jesus think about himself? Because if Jesus didn't think he was God, that's the end of the argument. But if he did, the second part of the argument is, was he right? So, what did Jesus say about himself? The first piece of evidence is the fact that his teaching was centered on himself. Most great religious teachers point away from themselves. They say, don't look at me, look at God. Jesus, who personified humility in pointing people to God, pointed to himself. He said, look at me, come to me. We've talked about this search for meaning and purpose, that feeling of like a spiritual hunger that other things don't quite satisfy. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I'm the one who can satisfy that spiritual hunger. Addiction is a major problem in our society. Jesus said, it's the son, in other words, if if he himself sets you free, you will be free indeed. 
Then there's all the stuff we carry around, worry, anxiety, guilt, fear. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He said, if you receive me, you receive God. If you welcome me, you welcome God. If you've seen me, you've seen God. Forgiveness is right at the heart of Christianity. Jesus went up to people and said, your sins are forgiven. Now, if someone sins against you, then you can forgive them, but you can't just walk up to anyone and say, your sins are forgiven. When Jesus said that, the lawyers said, who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus claimed to be able to do that. In fact, Jesus said that he came to give his life so that people could be forgiven. One of the most direct claims Jesus made is recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Now making a claim like this was seen by the religious leaders to be blasphemy. It's tantamount to a claim to be God, and it was punishable by death by stoning. People picked up stones to stone him. Then Jesus said to them, I've shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any of these, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere human being, claim to be God. I think when you look at all the evidence, it's clear that Jesus did make that claim. It is an astonishing claim. And a claim like that needs to be tested. If you think about it, there are only three possibilities. It was not true, and Jesus knew perfectly well it wasn't true, in which case he was a fraud. Or it was not true and he simply didn't realize it. He genuinely thought he was the son of God, in which case he was deluded. I think we'd say he was insane. But logically, there is only one other possibility. And that is, it's true. He was telling the truth. C.S. Lewis, Cambridge professor, best known as the author of the Chronicles of Narnia, he put it like this. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He'd either be insane or else he'd be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else insane or something worse. But let's not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He hasn't left that open to us. He didn't intend to. So was Jesus right in what he said about himself? What evidence is there to support his claims? Well, the first piece of evidence is his teaching. Much of the New Testament records numerous occasions where crowds gather to hear Jesus teach. And on one occasion, on a mountain like this, more than 5,000 people gathered to listen to the teaching of Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount has been widely acknowledged amongst the greatest teaching of all time. Jesus' teaching has been the foundation of our entire civilization. Many of our laws were originally founded on Jesus' teaching. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do to others as you would have them do to you. And then this, totally revolutionary. Love your enemies. In fact, we've advanced in every field of science and technology, yet in 2,000 years, no one has ever improved on the moral teachings of Jesus. They are the greatest words ever spoken. They're the kind of words you might expect God to speak. Another thing that marked Jesus' life was his love for the marginalized, feeding the hungry, healing the sick. His character has impressed millions who wouldn't call themselves Christians. Time magazine called him the most persistent symbol of purity, selflessness, and love in the history of Western humanity. He was a person in whom even his enemies could find no fault and whose friends said that he was without sin. It's been said that our character is truly tested when we're under pressure or in pain. And when Jesus was being tortured, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Another piece of evidence is his fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. No one else in history has had a whole collection of books written about them before they were born. Jesus fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies, 29 of them in a single day. Of course, it could be suggested he was a kind of clever con man who set out 
deliberately to deceive people. He read all these prophecies and he thought, right, I'm going to go through and I'm going to fulfill them all in my life. The difficulty with that theory is that, first of all, the sheer number of them. And then the fact that, humanly speaking, he had no control over many of these things. There were prophecies about the exact manner of his death, about the place of his burial, even about the place of his birth. Clever commander began and said, oh my goodness, I'm supposed to be born in Bethlehem. It's too late. Then the final piece of evidence, his conquest of death, the physical resurrection of Jesus is the cornerstone of Christianity. And this is relevant to every single one of us because we're all going to die. It's the ultimate statistic. One in one die. You go to a funeral. The coffin is lowered into the ground. It looks absolutely final. And it is. Unless Jesus died and was buried and then was raised to life. In which case, death has been conquered. But is this just wishful thinking? Um, Most of the dead. That's what I was taught. I'm not, I, I don't know, I can't say yes or no. Yes, I do believe that Jesus rose from the dead. As a man of science, I think that's pretty impossible. <laughs> I believe so. <laughs> yes, yes I did. I definitely don't think that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think he did. <laughs> no, Jesus did not, did not come back from the dead. That's ridiculous. Well, it could be used as a metaphor, right? Could have been a, a drug trip. Yeah, of course it did. I do believe in that, 100%. Just the relationship that I have with him is proof enough. I'm not sure, I haven't looked that up. Um, I, don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't know. There are four pieces of evidence for the resurrection. The first is his absence from the tomb. No one has ever satisfactorily explained how Jesus' body was absent from the tomb that first Easter day. People have come up with all kinds of explanations. For example, maybe the authorities stole the body. Well, in that case, why didn't they produce it when people started saying that he'd risen from the dead? Or perhaps the robbers stole the body. But when the disciples heard that Jesus had, had been seen, they ran to the tomb and they found that the tomb was not empty. Inside the tomb were the grave clothes that Jesus had been wrapped in. The only valuable thing that a robber might have taken was still there. The grave clothes had collapsed like a caterpillar's cocoon when a butterfly has emerged. And the piece that had been around Jesus' head had been folded up and put in a different place. And when they saw that, they believed. The second was his presence with the disciples. Jesus was seen on more than 11 occasions, on one occasion by a group of around 500 people. People say, well, it could have been a hallucination. Well, hallucination does happen among highly strong, very nervous or highly imaginative people, or people who are sick or are on drugs. But the disciples don't fit any of those categories. They were cynics like Thomas. There were tough fishermen, there were tax collectors, and tax collectors do not hallucinate. The third piece of evidence is the transformation that we see in the disciples. Here was a group of people who were disillusioned, despairing that their leader had died, and then suddenly they were transformed. They started saying, we've seen Jesus, he's really alive. And they went around telling everybody. Later on, practically all of them were killed, crucified, tortured, beheaded because of what they believed. And if they were deceiving people, all they had to do was say, no, 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 it's not actually true. But they never said that because they knew it was true. It had totally transformed their lives. And as a result, this extraordinary movement swept around the whole known world. And it's a movement without precedent in the history of humanity. And fourth, it's still happening today. There are now over 2.3 billion Christians around the world of every ethnicity, continent, nationality, economic, social and intellectual background. They all speak of this encounter with the risen Jesus Christ. So what are we to make of Jesus? It seems to me clear that Jesus really did claim to be a man whose identity was God. 
And when we look at the evidence of his teaching, his life, his character, his fulfillment of prophecy, his resurrection, to say he was insane or a fraud seems to me absurd, illogical, actually unbelievable. On the other hand, it provides the strongest possible supporting evidence that what Jesus said about himself was true. And when I looked at the evidence, when I read the New Testament, I came to the conclusion, it is true. I didn't want to become a Christian because I thought if I became a Christian, life would be totally miserable from that moment onward. So I tried to put it off. I thought I'll put off becoming a Christian to my deathbed. And then I realized that would not be intellectually honest. So very reluctantly, I kind of said, okay, yes. And at that moment, I can still remember that moment so clearly. It dropped from here, from my head, being convinced it was true, to here in my heart, having an experience of a relationship with Jesus. And finding what I guess looking back, unconsciously, I'd been searching for all my life. Something that provided ultimate meaning and purpose to my life. It was the very last place on earth that I expected to find it. But at that moment, I found that what Jesus said was true. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and life in all its fullness. It really is true that God has revealed himself in Jesus. Jesus really is who he claimed to be. Jesus really did rise from the dead. There is hope beyond this life. There is hope for this life. Right now, in this life, in an encounter with Jesus, we find life and life in all its fullness. When we try to put forth a religion as an answer, it's always going to come up empty. Again, why Jesus begins with, be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus was developing a relationship where he could be known and demonstrate that he knows. Once in Atlanta, I was invited to speak at an interfaith dialogue. I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. It was at a local mosque, and there was representatives from all the major world religions, Islam, Hinduism, um, but then there was a variety of what we might label as as cults, um, Moonies, uh, Universalists. It was, it, was, it, was, it was like nine or ten of us. And I, I was pretty nervous about it because I, I, I didn't think that I knew enough about, and I knew I didn't know enough about other these other world religions that I was going to be able to speak intelligently in this comparison. And even in this mosque, one room was filled with men and there was another room filled with women. And even driving over there, I'm, Lord, what, what, I mean, I, it was one of those when you say yes, but you don't know what you're going to do. That, that was, that's kind of where I was. I felt the Lord was very plain to me and said, you tell them about me. I said, well, I can do that. So we went from one person to the next. And what I found interesting is that as we went, they kept making reference to Christianity and how similar they were. And they got to be my turn. And I stood up. And I said, with all due respect to everyone in the room, actually, Christianity is not like any other religion because it centers on the person of Jesus and who he was, what he did, and what he continues to do. And then I, I finished my piece, and I sat down, and the next person immediately got up to talk about how similar their religion was to Christianity. <laughs> When it was all done, they opened it up to questions. And there was only one person that the questions were directed to for the next 20 minutes. Me. I had 
wanted to know about this person named Jesus. It's why it is the question. Because Jesus finishes that chapter by saying, hey, if you're going to choose me, you got to keep choosing me. He says you, you have to take up your cross daily and follow me because we, we live in this kingdom with his kingdom. And this kingdom is going to continue to try to lure us away from his truth and who he is. And there isn't one person in this room or in the sound of my voice that is exempt from those other voices. And it's why then when, when, we, when, we, when there is a revelation from God that Jesus is the Christ and that we are sinners. See, the, the world rejects the diagnosis of sin and because it rejects the diagnosis of sin, it's always going to reject the antidote or the answer to sin Christ. Does that make sense to you? Why, why, why do people want to avoid Jesus? Because it means you have to accept that we sin. But the, all of the culture treats us and wants us to become our own God, little g. All of Scripture drives us to be gods, capital G, apostrophe S, that we are his possession. And when we turn ourselves over to God, it's, it's funny to hear. One, isn't it always sound more, more authoritative when it comes from an English accent? <laughs> and then they showed you Jerusalem, so like we're all in, right? It, it's interesting that Nikki says it's something that I had, I said, well, if, even if it's true, I don't want to ruin my life now. I'll, I'll wait to the end. And Jesus even addresses that at the end of Matthew 16. He says, whoever wants to save their life, actually, you're going to lose it. But whoever will lose their life for me, you will have it. What kind of life? The kind of life Nikki talked about in John chapter 10. Life more and better than we would ever dreamed of. Aaron, come on up. I always try to think of... Who, who will be listening to the message today? You've heard me say that many, many times. On one hand, possibly you've been doing your own searching. As I said to begin with, I, I've, I've prayed, probably prayed with more people to receive Christ in Alpha courses than in any other context. The best story I have is a, a young man who was working at our church in our operations department, and he was doing so because he was community service for a DUI. He, he wasn't a believer, um, but he was dating someone that was a, in Gene and my youth group. And so she comes and says, can my college-age boyfriend, can he work off his community service here? And I said, sure he can. So we arranged for that to take place, and Stuart and I got to be friends. And um, it wasn't real long after that, Stuart came to me, and with his second DUI. And so things were a little bit more serious. He stayed on the church. He worked his community service. When he finished his community service, they actually offered him a full-time job. He took it as he was uh, still in college. And then I'll remember the day he came into my office and he said it was his third DUI and he was going to go to jail. And I said, Stuart, you've been around us now. You've hung around us for quite a while. What, what, do, you, what do you think about Jesus? I said, you, you understand you have a problem now, right? Do you, you understand you're an alcoholic. This is your th you're an alcoholic. You've got to do something about this. What do you think of Jesus? He said, honestly, I just haven't given Jesus much of a thought. Well, I was about to start the Alpha course. And I said, Stuart, do this. Come to Alpha. Come to Alpha. Come a couple weeks. He said, I don't know when they're going to, I don't know when my arraignment is. I, I said, just come until you have to go to jail. Will you do that? He said, I will. Comes the first week. The first week of Alpha talks about, uh, is Christianity boring, untrue, or irrelevant? The second week is this one. Who is Jesus? The third week talks about why did Jesus die? Well, this is a very compelling video. So he comes in to tell me that 
he won't be able to he won't be able to um, see the third one because he has court date and asked me if I would come and stand before the judge with him and I said I would and but I knew he was going to miss this one on why did Jesus die I mean it's it's the it's the hammer in alpha and I said well Stuart have have you what have you what have you thought about what you've watched and what do you think of Jesus? He said, well, don't worry, Charlie. He said, I've read ahead. There was a book that went with it. He said, I read ahead, and I've already asked Jesus in my life, and would you baptize me before I go to prison? I said, I'd love to. And he wasn't a week on cell block C in County Lockup where he was leading a Bible study. And when I reconnected with Stuart years later, Stuart is an elder at a church that a friend of mine actually leads in Augusta. Really, really cool. So why did I tell you that? I love when Gemma said, 2.3 billion believers over every ethnicity, every culture, every continent, every age, because it's true. Peter didn't have it all figured out, and he was able to say, you're the Christ. I'm still catching on, Jesus, but I know you're the Christ. And that's the call that he makes to each of us. Are you going to have how to live this life pattern out before you start this life? No. No. But you can have a recognition of who is the Christ, who is the real king, and a whole sea of kings, a whole sea of people wanting to be king in your life. There is a king. And it's the only king who gave himself fully to us so that we might have life. And if you're in this process, if you've been in the process, today would be the day to say, and don't you love, I love that Nikki just said, I finally said yes. He wasn't responding to a question by someone. He was responding to the Holy Spirit speaking to him in his life, revealing God to him. And he said, finally said, yes. How can a one answer a one-word answer, how can it carry that much weight? Because of what Jesus has already done. Because he's the one who's already paid the price for our sin. And that's why a one, a simple three-letter, one-word answer carries that much weight. Because he's done everything else. I know a lot of you. I don't know all of you. I don't know who's watching now. I have no idea who will pick this up archived a year from now. but I believe the Holy Spirit has revealed himself to you for you to say yes, and we'll pray in a minute. If you've already said yes, the end of Matthew 16 says, you got to keep making the decision. Not in the sense of a salvation decision, but to pick up your cross and follow Christ means, I've always seen it this way, I can go my way or his way. I'll get hit with a hundred choices today. I'll get hit with a thousand choices tomorrow. And so will you about doing things my way or this kingdom's way or be doing things his way or his kingdom's way. And let's not forget his warning at the very beginning of the chapter. Be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Be, be careful of what everybody else says about who Jesus is. Respond to the revelation of who he is in your life, that he is the life. And if you are a follower of Christ, then, then, then pick up that cross. And I hope today watching this, ver this piece of Alpha that you actually even feel more confident in your decision than before. That, that you, knew, you knew it was real, but if you got hard-pressed on, on, well, how do you believe the New Testament, you would have been, well, you know, I don't know. Well, I'm not expecting anybody to remember all the dates and times and everything, but you know there's something there. And lastly, I just want to invite all of you to Alpha when we start in September. If you've never, I, there's, there's multiple Alpha folks in the room today. And you've already been through Alpha. Raise your hand. And so if you got a, hey, I want to know a little bit more. You saw a bunch of hands raised. It is, it is a wonderful experience. But let's, let's end our time in prayer. Father, whether it's someone in the room or someone watching right now on Facebook, someone that will pick it up archived later. And it probably will ambush them at some, at some point. But the question still is there. And we're going to have to face it at one time or another. Who's Jesus? Who do we think you are? 
And Father, I pray that there would be men and women and kids that would respond today with the answer, yes. Yes. I will follow you. Now for those who have settled the issue but still get bounced around between kingdoms, Lord, may this new revelation today or may this maybe old revelation become new again where we will continue to choose your kingdom because that's the path to life. There is no other path to life other than your kingdom. And may your spirit grow inside of us. May the yeast of the kingdom grow so deeply in us that it won't just impact how we live our lives, but, Lord, that it will impact anybody that we come in contact with. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.